Okay, we'll get started here. Welcome back to the Collaborative Science for Estuaries webinar series. This is Nick Sobral with the Science Collaborative. I'm joined remotely by Megan Brass and Lena Madonna. And today we're going to talk about unmanned aerial systems, commonly called drones, and how they can offer an opportunity to improve tidal wetland monitoring programs. So over the past couple of years, this project team who is with us today worked with six national estuarine research reserves in the southeast and Caribbean to develop, assess, and collaboratively refine a protocol for drone operation, data management, and data analysis. And our webinar today features some members of that project team who I'll introduce shortly. Uh, but first, look at the brief bit of background on the reserve system in the Science Collaborative and our webinar series. So for those who are new to the webinar series, uh, the National Estuarine Research Reserve System is a national network of unique research reserves as shown on this map right here. And this is a NOAA program that works in collaboration with a local place-based partner, either a state agency, university, or nonprofit. Each reserve site includes programs focused on land stewardship, research and scientific monitoring, training programs for the public and local officials, and education. Science Collaborative supports science for estuarine and coastal decision makers by coordinating regular funding opportunities and supporting user-driven collaborative research, assessment, and transfer activities that address critical coastal management needs identified by the reserves. The webinar series features project teams supported by the Science Collaborative, program staff, and our partners, and speakers share their unique approaches to addressing current coastal and estuarine management issues. And if that sounds interesting to you, you can feel free to join us for future webinars to learn about new methods to integrate technical experts and uses of project outputs into the research process and how the research results and products might inform your own work. Quick bit of housekeeping before we get started. All attendees are muted on entry and we'll be handling questions via the Q&A feature on that console there. You can enter questions as they occur to you throughout the presentation. In fact, we encourage you to so that you don't forget them. And using that feature, we'll discuss as many as we can during the final portion of today's webinar. So the chat's visible to organizers only, and you can use it to alert us to any technical issues you might have as well. And with that, I will introduce our speakers for today just really quickly, and we'll hear a bit more about them later in the presentation as well. Um, but first, I'll just quick run through. So Brandon Puckett served as the research coordinator at the North Carolina National Estuarine Research Reserve for the last seven years before recently transitioning to a research biologist position with the NOAA National Centers for Coastal Ocean Science. Woody Jenkins has been the coordinator of the North Carolina uh, Coastal Training Program since 2002. Justin Ridge, who leads the Duke University Marine Robotics and Sensing Labs Coastal Mapping Research. Christiana Falvo, a drone pilot and research technician in Duke's Marine Robotics and Remote Sensing Lab. Eric Smith, who's the manager at the North Inlet Winyah Bay Reserve. Brittany Morris, a research specialist at the North Inlet Winyah Bay Reserve. And Alex North, who serves as the stewardship coordinator for the GTM Reserve in Florida. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Brandon so that he can walk through the overview of the presentation first. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for the, the introduction, uh, Nick. Appreciate that. And on behalf of the project team, certainly excited to be here today to present uh, sort of what we've learned from this year-long, 18-month uh, Catalyst project supported by the Near Science Collaborative. And, and what the project this team decided to do today is sort of a hybrid approach. So I'm going to give about a 20-minute presentation here with some highlights of the project, and then we're going to have um, a series of panel questions and an open Q&A with the audience. So that's sort of how things will flow today. Um, general goal of this project was to really conduct a regionally coordinated effort working with the six National Estuarine Research Reserves from North Carolina to Puerto Rico to uh, develop, implement, and, and refine a, a, a wetland monitoring protocol using drones to see how accurately, reliably drones and the image-based products from drones could um, really estimate um, commonly monitored uh, wetland parameters, such as those measured, uh, estimated, monitored in the, the NEARS system-wide monitoring program. And so for those of you external to the NEARS, um, the system-wide monitoring program, the acronym is SWMP or SWAMP. And like any project, we had to have some catchy names. So we are uh, informally Drone the Swamp, which was um, our, our, our uh, take or play on the, our past president's uh, political rallying cry, Drain the Swamp. All right. Um, so everyone on this call is pretty aware. Um, 
you know, wetlands are, are uh, well, common habitat features in, in estuarine systems and, and certainly valuable for all the benefits and services they provide. Since they occupy sort of that narrow band between open water and uplands, they're uniquely positioned really um, uh, to be impacted by both climate and anthropogenic stressors. And monitoring certainly plays a huge role in, detect in detecting those stressors and associated changes. Um, and as a result, many organizations and entities, um, such as the NEARS through the system-wide monitoring program, have invested fairly heavily time and resources in monitoring wetlands and associated change. And so um, oftentimes monitoring programs are, um, the wetland monitoring programs are, are, are sort of uh, involve kind of plot-based permanent plots at kind of quadrat scales or um, and or um, imagery from uh, remotely sent satellites. Um, and both of those approaches certainly have strengths. So for instance, the, the resolution and granularity you get by literally sticking your head in a, in a quadrat to measure and, and, and monitor vegetation um, and satellites, which um, offer expansive spatial coverage. But both of those approaches also have some uh, limitations and issues that, that we probably ought to consider as well. So uh, one of which shown here in this panel, this A panel here, are that um, permanent plots, quadrats, can miss important spatial heterogeneity. So this, those yellow squares there um, uh, representing permanent plots along the white transects are missing that um, uh, marsh die-off marked by the, um, the the red outline there. <clears throat> the ground-based surveys along transects can also cause disturbance to the marsh platform. So you can see the scars here from satellite imagery um, along the permanent transects at the North Carolina site. And then zooming way out, um, satellites can at times offer sort of insufficient resolution spatially to maybe delineate important, important ecotones or identify species-specific um, vegetation. Um, and also, uh, you have a lot less flexibility in terms of timing of, of image acquisition. Um, we're in wetlands, tidal wetlands particularly, uh, tides and, and, and water levels is, is very important in terms of the quality of image products. So we, as a project team, asked, can you know, drones uh, bridge this gap between quadrats and satellites. And there's certainly a burgeoning literature uh, that suggests that, that yes, indeed it can. Um, so here's the project team. Uh, Nick introduced some of us, but not all of us. And I can't go through everyone's name. It would take too long, but um, just wanted to give a huge shout out to the project team. They've been very engaged throughout the entire process. I think primarily, or at least one reason, because they're also the primary end users of the project. So that certainly helps with engagement. Um, but just from the south, we had staff from the, the Hobus Bay Reserve in Puerto Rico, uh, staff from the GTM Reserve in Florida, uh, staff from uh, Sapelo Island in Georgia, uh, reserve staff from Ace Basin and North Inlet, Bay, North Inlet Winyaw Bay in, in South Carolina, and then staff from the North Carolina uh, Reserve as well. We also had technical experts from Duke University um, and NOAA's Office for Coastal Management. I do want to highlight just a couple people really quick for um, uh, really extraordinary uh, contributions to the project. So first, uh, Whitney Jenkins, she was our collaborative lead on the project. She's the Coastal Training Program Coordinator at the North Carolina Reserve um, and really did an outstanding job sort of shepherding us through this true kind of co-development um, from sort of generation of the project idea to development and implementation and refinement of um, our, our standardized protocol on the back end. Uh, Justin Ridge at Duke University was our technical lead on the project and really he um, did a pretty amazing job sort of getting us over the hurdles that come with working with a bunch of folks that that really are, are wetland scientists and managers but but not remote sensors, not image, image analyst experts, not you're pretty new to, to drone technology. So did a wonderful job with that. Um, also, uh, Christiana Favo at Duke, Brittany Morris at North Inlet, and Charlie Deaton at um, the North Carolina Reserve, along with Justin and I, um, served as the technical team and, and, and 
they did a ton of work uh, drafting all of the protocol documents, but also serving as a liaison um, between the technical team and the reserves uh, during the implementation phase. Um, and then also in parallel with the reserves as they analyzed imagery from their sites, uh, the technical team also analyzed uh, the same imagery. Uh, lastly, I want to highlight a project that we leveraged uh, for this project. It was led by um, Jenny Davis uh, uh, with NOAA INCOS and funded by uh, NOAA's Office of Atmospheric Research uh, Unmanned Aircraft Systems Program. Uh, so a few of us on this project team were also on Jenny's project, and the idea there was, was sort of to conduct a sensitivity analysis of sorts to uh, really identify the impact of, of things like um, flight altitude, um, uh, number and configuration of ground control points, uh, different sensor types, different uh, uh, processing software, how the impact of all of that had on sort of the quality accuracy of, of, of products derived from drones. And the, the best practices developed from that project, we sort of leveraged and implemented in our project. Okay, so the sort of the technical approach um, is centered around this, this idea of pairing drone and ground-based surveys together. Uh, we, we, we took the, the estimates of uh, parameter estimates from ground-based surveys as the truth and assessed the accuracy of image-derived estimates against that. Um, you know, there's caveats there, right? Any of you that have done ground-based surveys know that there's some subjectivity there, particularly with parameters like percent cover, but that's the approach we took. Um, for ground-based surveys, sort of shown here on the left panel, um, there were a number of parameters we were interested in estimating. Um, we estimated um, uh, ground elevation in our permanent plots, so greater than around 30 or more plots at each site um, using RTK. Um, canopy height was estimated by measuring 10 uh, randomly chosen stems of the dominant uh, vegetation species in each permanent plot. Uh, ecotones were delineated at a couple sites. Um, using backpack mounted uh, RTK. Um, percent cover uh, was estimated a couple of different ways in permanent plots, either visually or using the point intercept method. Um, and then lastly, biomass was estimated at above ground biomass was estimated at, at three sites by clipping um, all the vegetative tissue within a biomass plot, uh, taking it back to the lab, washing, uh, 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 drying, and weighing. So on the right side, sort of for the drone-derived products, um, each of the reserves had access to um, kind of a basic off-the-shelf commercial, you know, uh, drone system, uh, relatively inexpensive, most of them. Um, everyone had an RGB sensor and or a multispectral sensor. Um, let's see, we, we standardized flight altitude, so flew at 50 meters, a standardized front and side overlap for imagery, image acquisition at 75%. Um, we all uh, uh, deployed and, and surveyed in ground control points. Um, the imagery was, was subsequently analyzed and or processed in either PIX4D mapper or drone to map, depending on what um, each of the, the reserve teams had access to. And then the, the, the resulting products were analyzed in, in ArcGIS. Uh, and so we, we, we generated really three products from the drone uh, imagery. So 2D ortho mosaics, which is kind of the composite of stitched together, all the stitched together imagery. Uh, 3D elevation models of kind of bare earth. So uh, digital terrain model, it's called, um, as well as uh, surface models, which are supposedly the, the, the top of the canopy. And then also de developed uh, multispectral indices, namely uh, normalized difference vegetation index or NDVI. Okay, and just a little context for um, our study sites. Again, working in the Southeast uh, Caribbean region, um, you know, traditional sort of Southeastern salt marshes, at least at several of the sites. So uh, North Carolina, North Inlet, Ace, and Sapelo really dominated in the low marsh by Spartina alterniflora monocultures. Um, and then as at, at mid or higher elevations tend to get a little more diversity, um, which, which may look like patches of salicornia, it may look like patches of juncus. Um, in North Carolina, for instance, it's kind of this stickless spicata, Peyton's, Barichia mix. Um, at GTM, uh, the, the, the vegetation there was almost exclusively uh, juncus ramurianus. 
And then at Hobus Bay, the only mangrove site included in the study, um, dominated by black and to a lesser degree, uh, red mangrove. Okay, so um, I'm just gonna go through a few of the results slides here. Um, uh, first of all is, is elevation and canopy height. Um, I'm presenting those together um, because in the image analysis workflow, canopy height is, is estimated um, from the elevation models generated from the drone uh, products. And so as you're all aware, elevation is a supremely important uh, parameter uh, for, for wetlands, uh, among other things, uh, determines vegetation type, productivity, et cetera. Canopy height is important to monitor, well, at least in part, because it's a, it's a, one of the parameters you would use to, for instance, uh, allometrically estimate above ground biomass. And so here, I've, 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 and what we're interested in is sort of the accuracy, the agreement that with which we're able to reproduce what we measure on the ground with, with what we uh, estimate and derive from our drone products. And so this is just a simple correlation plot here with uh, uh, elevation, surface elevation measured uh, via field surveys on the x-axis. Uh, x -axis. So again, that's, that's with RTK. And then on the y-axis, we have our modeled elevation digital terrain model generated from, from drone products. The, the different colored symbols are um, the different sites involved in the project. The, the black dashed line is, is the one-to-one -one line, so that's sort of perfect agreement between the two approaches. And then the red line is the best fitting uh, regression line uh, for, for, all those, for all the data points there. And so a couple points to make here. So first of all, the two, you know, what we modeled, the elevation we modeled is generally positively and linearly related to um, what we measured in the field, um, albeit, as you see by that red line, generally overestimating um, uh, elevation from our from our 3D models, uh, digital terrain models from the drone. Um, and that's simply because in areas where uh, there's dense vegetation here, generally, um, the, the, the sensor generally is not able to penetrate that vegetation and the, the photogrammetry software is not really able to filter the point cloud very well to, to, to really create a bare earth model. And uh, because canopy height is really a function of, of our 3D models from the drone products, um, canopy height, that error cascades through um, uh, to canopy height. So again, similar plot set up here with what we measured, canopy height we measured in the field on the x-axis with what we modeled from drones on the y-axis. And it's pretty obvious right away that one, one that the two aren't very well correlated at all, to be honest. And then um, two, we generally way underestimate canopy height um, uh, using the drone derived products and that's again because that digital terrain model um, is is um, you know, overestimating uh, what the, the surface elevation of the marsh <laughs> uh, next parameter we'll get to is um, the results for the ecotones and so these are important transitions where um, you know, change uh, such as shoreline erosion or, or marsh migration uh, may be detected and so here I've shown a map or a subset of a map of the North Carolina site uh, with the three ecotones we were interested in, in, in delineating. So um, going from left to right, the, the blue uh, is the, the water wetland ecotone. The orange uh, is the, the low high marsh ecotone. And then to the right, the green is the, the marsh upland ecotone. Um, and, and, and so the, the solid lines for those various colors are what we delineated, the ecotone delineation from uh, based on imagery and the, the dotted lines are um, what we delineated in the field using um, backpack mounted uh, RTK. And so you can see just visually, I mean, pretty good agreement along the water wetland ecotone, the blue there. Um, and, and decent agreement uh, for the low high marsh until you get to certain areas where the difference between the two approaches is pretty drastic. Um, the marsh upland ecotone, uh, pretty good agreement as well, although this is a back barrier island system, so um, uh, it's pretty easy to delineate that in a, a forested upland. That would be much, much more difficult, I, I suspect. And so what we see uh, when we when we just sort of basically plot the, the data with ecotone of interest sort of on the uh, x-axis here and average distance between what we measured in the field uh, or the, the, the location of the ecotone measured in the field versus what we delineated uh, from imagery on the y-axis. 
you see that the accuracy of ecotone delineation is, is, is dependent upon the ecotone that you're measuring. So for instance, the wetland water and the wetland upland ecotones, fairly uh, accurate uh, at North Carolina. So that was um, you know, on the order of two, on average, two tenths to three tenths of a meter. So for fairly close uh, correspondence there. Whereas the low high marsh ecotone um, in North Carolina is, is, is the, the difference is, is on average over a meter, so it's not very accurate there. Albeit at Sapelo Island, that same low high marsh ecotone was, was much more accurately delineated with imagery um, relative to, to field based measures. Okay, next, um, talk a little bit about um, total percent cover. Um, which we were interested in, in, in estimating um, because not only does it give sort of a, a, an estimate of kind of vegetative coverage at, at your given site, um, it could also be used for a crude, uh, uh, perhaps rapid kind of estimate of, of site integrity. Um, so here what I've shown is a map of the North Inlet Winyah Bay site where the green colors um, are what is classified as vegetated, uh, the brown colors are what's classified as uh, unvegetated, and those little uh, squares you see are the permanent plots uh, within which we compared uh, field-based estimates or percent cover to what we estimated from imagery. And so a couple points to make here. So overall, the classifications accuracy of these sort of vegetated versus unvegetated maps was really high. Um, on an average across the six sites, it was um, uh, about 85%, so pretty high classification accuracy. <laughs> but when we look at sort of the estimates of percent cover within these square meter plots, the agreement between what we measure in the field and, and what we um, estimate from imagery is not, not, not as good. So uh, shown here uh, in the plot to the right is uh, reserve on the x-axis and then uh, percent difference between uh, Total percent cover of vegetated percent cover uh, what's measured in the field versus imagery. Negative values there indicate that the imagery uh, estimates of total percent cover were higher than those estimated from the field. So just a couple of take home points for this figure. Generally speaking, um, we're overestimating uh, percent cover of vegetation um, based on image derived products with the exception of, of at Ace Basin. And then secondly, um, the interquartile ranges, so the boxes at each of those reserves, and, and especially the, the whiskers, so the min and max values um, of the differences are, are pretty large, uh, probably in excess of 25% um, at each site. Uh, so, so pretty limited agreement correspondence accuracy, um, if you will, of, of, of total percent cover estimates from, from image-based products. Taking percent cover to sort of a step further, we, we wanted to see if we could get at species specific percent cover um, at our sites. Uh, certainly would be useful for habitat mapping purposes and also for you know, community uh, composition analyses. <laughs> so I've shown the same map of North Inlet Winyah Bay site here, albeit with much more detail this time. So um, generally uh, at species specific levels, although there's some mixed meadow kind of groupings as well. Um, so the orange color you see is, is the low marsh um, Spartina alterniflora sort of monoculture. The bright greens are uh, Juncus ramerianus. The, the pinkish magenta color is uh, Salicornia depressa. The mixed meadows are uh, kind of a combo of uh, Limonium and Barichia and uh, Distichlis and, and other species. Uh, brown is, is um, a Rack, which is really only over here. Uh, Unvegetated is the purple, and then uh, yellow is is Distichlis spicata. And so, um, an amazing amount of detail on this map, um, and actually fairly high classification success again at species specific or grouping levels um, across our sites. On average, about seventy four percent, which is pretty good. But you can see some error, right? I mean, there, there's I'm, I'm guessing, I'm pretty confident that this is not Distichlis down here, uh, given the elevation and um, not. So uh, some error, but for the most part, a high level of detail and, and fairly accurate. And when you compare that to what we generate from our from the from the NEARS uh, 
swamp habitat mapping program, um, the amount of detail is, is, is really in, in, incredible. So the colors on the, the map on the right aren't supposed to correspond with those on the, the map on the left. I just want to generate just to show you how, how the level of detail or difference in that level of detail without really compromising a whole lot in the way of, of accuracy. Although the, the swamp habitat mapping is done at a reserve wide scale, so much larger spatial scale. Um, but at, at sites of intense study where this level of detail may be, may be warranted, uh, drone derived maps, species specific maps um, uh, may be uh, quite useful. I'm not going to show the um, sort of the comparison between uh, species specific percent cover between field and, and image based. Uh, estimates because it really wasn't close. I think the interquartile ranges across all the species exceeded probably 40% or something in difference. So, so not very good agreement there. Um, lastly, uh, above ground biomass um, and, 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 and an important parameter for, for primary production, but also for, for processes like carbon sequestration in wetlands. And what we're interested in here is the relationship between above ground biomass and multispectral indices. Again, namely, normalized difference vegetation index. Um, there's quite a bit of literature, especially in agriculture, um, demonstrating a, a relationship there. And so um, here I've, I've got a, a plot with above ground biomass on the x-axis, uh, NDVI uh, on the y-axis. Um, and this is for the relationship for um, uh, at Spartina alterniflora sort of monoculture stands at North Carolina in the dark blue, North Inlet Winyah Bay in the light blue, and then Ace Basin uh, in the orange. And so just a couple take home here. Pretty strong positive linear correlations between biomass and NDVI um, at these three sites, although definitely some site specificity, right, because the, uh, the slope and intercepts of these uh, various relationships is, is, is different. Um, and I should note that this was um, all of these were generated um, using the same sensor in the same airframe. Air, air uh, so huge thanks to Eric Smith for traveling to North Carolina and ACE to, to, to fly at those sites. Uh, we're also interested in, in, in sort of beyond the, the, the monoculture Spartina stands to um, the relationship of, of biomass and NDVI and, and mixed species assemblages. And, and as you can see here with the plot of, of the Spartina alterna flora in dark blue and the mixed species in the light blue, that tends to break down a little bit uh, and gets a little more complicated there. So I think um, there's quite a bit of work left to be done to disentangle some of the species specific um, uh, NDVI biomass relationships. Um, but in general, um, even if it's just an alternate flora monoculture stands, the ability to uh, predict um, biomass, above ground biomass at landscape scales using NDVI is, is, is pretty impressive, I think. <laughs> okay, and lastly, just to conclude here, um, uh, a, a few thoughts uh, that I'd like to just, I guess, uh, sort of leave with before we transition to the, 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 the panel. Um, and that I think. This project and a really a growing body of, of literature suggests that 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 drones have a place in, in, in improving uh, wetland monitoring. Um, just the, the 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 spatial sort of the resolution spatial coverage, at least at landscape scales, but then that temporal flexibility um, is is hugely important to detect um, changes that are really important to you know, wetland scientists and managers. And so I've tried to show in the table here sort of uh, what kind of didn't work and what did work um, uh, for this project. So the parameters on the rows and uh, accuracy, low, medium, high, uh, and the columns there. Um, so elevation and canopy height, right? Not, not very good elevation models that cascaded to canopy height. Um, certainly much to be done to improve that because elevation and being able to get that at, at landscape scales would be uh, incredible. I will say that the, the elevation models generated at North Carolina and North Inlet were, were comparable to, to LIDAR based models um, generated at the same sites from, from uh, uh, aircraft flights. Uh, ecotones, it was kind of a mixed bag. Um, sort of the water wetland ecotone was, was, was um, pretty accurately delineated from imagery, but um, definitely some questions in those transitions, for instance, the, the low uh, high marsh transition. Although I should say that it's not always easy on the fly in the field to delineate that um, trend, that ecotone either. Habitat classification, even at species specific level, was really high. 
um, although that didn't translate to accurate or at least reproducible estimates of, of percent cover when, when, when compared to what we measured in the field. Um, and then perhaps most exciting, I think, is, is this relationship between biomass, NDVI, and, and other um, multispectral indices that, that has some real promise and, and potentially um, reducing the need to go out and count stems and, 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 and measure canopy height. And then lastly, uh, you know, this was targeted at end users that uh, this project was targeted at end users that that are relatively new to, to drone technology and, 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 and image analysis and, and those types of things. So we've developed as the primary product of this project, a protocol for monitoring coastal wetlands with drones that provides a really detailed, like almost cookbook level detail um, uh, uh, workflow for what we did for image acquisition, processing and analysis. And hopefully that's useful for um, building technical capacity and reducing sort of the activation energy to, to, to begin integrating uh, drones within uh, wetland monitoring programs. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Whitney to uh, facilitate the, um, the panel uh, discussion. Great. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you so much for that overview of the project. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Whitney Jenkins. I'm the training coordinator for the North Carolina National Estuarine Research Reserve and collaborative lead on this project. So we will now transition to a panel discussion with end users and the technical team from this project. Um, so our first question is for Christiana Falvo. Christiana is a drone pilot and research technician for Duke University's Marine Robotics and Remote Sensing Lab, and she's also a member of this project's technical team. So Christiana, from a technical perspective, what were the biggest challenges this project brought? Thank you, Whitney. Yeah, so from a technical team's perspective, um, one of the primary challenges we faced with this project was ensuring reproducibility throughout the entirety of the process. So Brandon's overview slides gave us a good sense of the amount of variability that we had in this project. And that was mostly uh, as a result of operating in six different NEARS reserves. And so within each reserve, and across all six, you not only have variation in sort of the marsh landscapes, but also each team has a different mix of expertise and kind of previous experience with drones. We have a slew of different equipment at each site, so drones, sensors, um, processing softwares. All of this variability is um, sort of an opportunity for the end result to come out a little bit different. And, you know, without sort of accounting for this variability, that's sort of a risk of coming out the other side with, with some variation in your answers. So a challenge for the technical team was to develop a protocol that was both clear and detailed enough, um, much like a recipe, like Brandon sort of said, so that a slew of different users could put in inputs and essentially get outputs that were able to be compared. So that development of this protocol, sort of our best practices in collecting, processing, and analyzing drone imagery was the first huge step we took towards eliminating as much variation as we could in the process. Um, but then we sort of took it a step further and while the reserve teams were in the process of, you know, collecting and processing and analyzing their respective imagery, we had tech team members. So one tech team member sort of paired up with the reserve team and in, you know, conjunction with them, took their imagery input, fed it through this sort of image processing recipe and did a reproducibility check to ensure that the output, so the ortho imagery, the elevation models, and the multispectral indices that were produced um, were good quality and comparable so that we could be confident that, you know, when we took those outputs to the analysis stage, um, you know, the comparisons we were making between the drone-derived data and the field-derived data were, were good comparisons to make. So, those two things were um, big successes in how we kind of tackled that reproducibility challenge. 
Thank you, Christiana. And I just want to let everyone know that Nick is putting these um, discussion questions into the chat box here. So if you miss the question, you can just look back in there and see um, what the panelists are addressing. So moving on, our next question is for Brittany Morse. Brittany is a research specialist at the North Inlet Winya Bay National Estuarine Research Reserve, as well as a member of this project's technical team. So Brittany, going into the project, each site was equipped with different aircraft platforms and sensors. What challenges and opportunities did that present to the technical team? Hi, Whitney. Thank you. Um, so I'd say the biggest challenge that the technical team faced was developing and writing a protocol that was generic enough to accommodate all the different aircraft platforms and sensors that were used across the six sites, yet it was specific enough so that the protocols could allow users to generate tangible as well as consistent and comparable products similar to what Christiana just talked about. So this also provided us with the opportunity to compare these aircrafts and sensors and learn that the results are site and sensor specific. So the project team flew the same aircraft equipped with the same multi-spectral sensor at three different sites, which was North Inlet, Ace Basin, and North Carolina near. We found that the relationship between above ground biomass and NDVI were different across the sites, with biomass at a given NDVI value generally lower at the Ace Basin and North Carolina near over than at the North Inlet near, um, although the same aircraft was flown at all of these sites. Um, conversely, uh, when two different sensors, an Altum and a Centera, were used and compared at the North Carolina site, we found that the above ground biomass and NDVI relationship was similar in both strength and slope. However, they did have very uh, they had very different Y intercepts, indicating that biomass relationships are also sensor specific. So despite that difference, um, cross calibrations among sensors are possible, particularly when the NDVI biomass relationships have the same slope. So the need and, abil the need and ability to cross calibrate among sensors is an important consideration since sensors are likely to change in time. And the key to successful monitoring is comparability and reproducibility over time. Great, thank you, Brittany. So our next question is for a couple of our project end users. And first up is Alex North, who is the stewardship coordinator with the GTM National Estuarine Research Reserve. So Alex, how are you using or expanding on this project and the protocols developed to address other coastal management issues? Hi, Whitney. Thank you very much. Um, so here at GTM, um, we're beginning to collect baseline imagery using our UAVs uh, with RGB and multispectral cameras. Um, we'll be starting with six areas that are co-located with our surface elevation tables or our SETs, SETs, within the reserve boundary. Um, mapping image processing and GIS analysis protocols um, will be the same as the Drone the Swamp project. The UAV uh, will allow the reserve to cover large areas around the set locations and begin mapping habitats for future change analysis work and look at the water marsh edge ecotone to also measure change. These sites are primarily Spartina areas of, uh, with areas of juncus and mangroves intermixed. We will also begin testing other image indices to maybe parse out the unvegetated areas better and look into using RGB specific indices if multispectral imagery is not an option. Uh, we currently use NDVI or the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index in conjunction with RGB imagery to conduct habitat mapping and analysis. Thank you, Alex. And so um, I'm going to turn it now over to Eric Smith, who is the manager with the North Inlet Winya Bay National Estuarine Research Reserve. Eric, same question. How are you using or expanding on this project and the protocols developed to address other coastal management issues? Yeah, thanks, Whitney. Um, we're pretty excited about the results of this project, uh, and we are charging ahead with it. Um, I'd like to say that that thanks to this project, we've really operationalized the use of drones and multispectral imagery in 
expanding, complementing our routine monitoring, monitoring efforts as part of the reserves uh, system-wide monitoring program in a couple of key ways. Um, like Alex, we are we continue to work to refine the habitat map efforts uh, with the drones, RGB and multispectral. Um, our goal there is to sort of increase the resolution of our efforts to quantify marsh community vegeta marsh vegetation community responses to change sea level rise, et cetera. But I think I'm probably most excited about the results um, converting NDVI, and, and we've tried other spectral indices as well, um, into biomass, at least for Spartina. Uh, we've continued to work on that. We've now generated um, calibration curves across multiple seasons. We found that we can create one annual calibration curve. You know, the R squared is on the order of 0.75, so pretty high predictive power. So we're actually now flying our so-called sentinel site areas of the marsh on a at least monthly, um, ideally every two weeks during the primary growing season, sort of when morning um, tides align right, and really tracking biomass um, over time, you know, generating seasonal biomass curves, growth curves, doing that over years to look at how productivity in the marsh um, varies um, temporally and spatially, sort of at scales we could never do before. And then combining that with um, elevation surveys, actual RTK elevation surveys along our boardwalk to transects to sort of test some of the hypotheses uh, regarding spatial distributions of biomass and tidal inundation. I think, um, you know, tracking how that changes interannually among different environmental conditions, drought, um, high tidal flooding, et cetera, will really, you know, improve our ability to understand, model, predict um, salt marsh responses to sea level rise, et cetera, moving forward. So we we really intend to, to keep going with this as, as a routine monitoring effort. Great, thank you, Eric. So our next question is for our project's technical lead, Justin Ridge. Justin is also with Duke University's Marine Robotics and Remote Sensing Lab. So Justin, how will changing technology impact the future of this work? How well will this protocol age? And what would help improve the process? All right, thanks, Whitney. Uh, well, thanks to the vast amount of work that the technical team did and what was reiterated by Christiana and Brittany uh, just now, I feel like the protocol is pretty robust and the general workflow is going to still be applicable even as technology is changing and advancing. Um, and a lot of these advancements will likely just strengthen the various aspects of the protocol. Um, when we talk about uh, like how sensors are going to be changing and that we'll have increasing resolution um, with newer sensors. Um, it's really just going to make the products even better, generally, that it's still going to follow the same process that the protocol has put in place. And so we'll actually end up, you know, some of what Brandon was talking about with like how well some of these products go in the different, um, different pieces of the, the project that We'll probably start seeing some improvements to the surface models, the models, the 3D models that are generated because that is very reliant on, you know, the resolution of the sensors and, and how how well, uh, how crisp the images are. Um, and with that as well, our ability to differentiate different species uh, is, is going to improve too. So it's just going to make that more powerful. The... And with uh, changing process, like the processing workflows that we use, um, as those change, and I'm talking primarily about like the, the software packages that we've used uh, and how we toggle all the different pieces um, in there into how those generate the products, um, those are going to become easier too with, with just how everything is, is advancing. Um, we struggled with 
you know, some of how coordinate systems are incorporated into the products and, and how everyone uh, goes through that process, uh, particularly with the vertical coordinate systems and, and how limited um, you, you some of the limitations that you have with the outputs from these softwares. Uh, but that should get easier as they're they're incorporating more and more um, of even like local datums into these softwares. And, and with that, uh, there's a lot of toolkits that are coming out that are, that are being developed. Um, Esri's released like new deep learning tools that some of what this work could easily just be like incorporated into as as more of these tools are are released. And I would say thinking about like what we might want to tweak the protocol, like something that might uh, we'd want to tweak the the protocol for is with uh platforms that are now becoming more easier access with uh rtk and pbk gps um, capabilities so those are the post-processing processing kinematic and real-time kinematic um, systems uh as those become more accessible for groups to to have you know that process of incorporating um, into the workflow that's not something we've really roped into the protocol yet um, but that would be highly useful and it would mean even more accurate products without uh, as much reliance on ground control, which is something we have put into the to the protocol. Um, and also, there's a, a the potential for like how we would incorporate more um, lidar technology and like how that's becoming uh, used in some of these systems. So, thank you, Justin. And our final question, we're going to send it back to Brandon, um, who all, you all know is a project lead and is now with NOAA's National Centers for Coastal Ocean Science. So, Brandon, what are the next steps for the National Estuarine Research Reserve System and other end users? The project has provided examples of implementation at the site level, but how can we scale up to the national level? Yeah, thanks, Whitney. Um, yeah, so for the next step for the NEARS, I think, is really considering adopting the technology for wetland monitoring, but it also has some applications outside of the research and stewardship sectors to, you know, there's outreach and education opportunities there as well. So I think it's a rich technology that the NEARS probably should and is really uh, investing in. And for instance, you know, at Elkhorn SLU in California, reserve staff have done some really neat um, drone-based research and monitoring of, of fairly large-scale marsh restoration projects. So it is happening across the system already. Um, I guess my hope is that this project, its findings, this webinar, um, generate a little bit of excitement uh, and, and regarding the potential for drones uh, to, to complement existing swamp biomonitoring, wetland monitoring approaches, and potentially even swamp habitat mapping. Yes, there's, you know, the dialogue needs to continue um, within the NEARS. Research and stewardship sectors have talked a bit about this, and I think should continue it probably at the annual meeting to, to kind of normalize the approach, gauge um, appetite and interest, uh, identify reserves that are interested kind of in moving this whole process forward, and then um, really explore developing um, a UAS-based wetland monitoring swamp toolkit, like a proper toolkit that would be used uh, in the in the system wide monitoring program. I think all of this is ripe for to transfer across uh, geographies and or uh, vegetation species across the system. Um, and perhaps the science collaborative through a transfer grant or, or something like that could support the expansion of the work geographically and or development of the, the UAS based uh, wetland monitoring swamp toolkit. Um, and I think for reserves looking to really get started in drone work, you know, building technical capacity is, is hugely important. Um, and hopefully that sort of the, the protocol we've developed is a start there, but some trainings are probably in order as well. Um, and I guess beyond the NEARS, uh, you know, there, there are many entities, organizations that are, are interested in or are already really applying drone technology for wetland monitoring. You know, for those that are interested but not haven't yet jumped in, I think, um, again, our hope is that those end users that were really were like us before we started this project um, can can sort of use what we've developed and to reduce their kind of activation energy to, to get going. 
Um, and for those already using drones, I think there's certainly some, some many unanswered questions. The species specific identification, those relationships, uh, biomass, et cetera, are, are unanswered. Um, but beyond monitoring, I think, as Eric mentioned, there's sort of real potential to use drones for hypothesis based research. Um, and then lastly, I, there may be sufficient interest and expertise to develop some sort of drone wetland kind of community of practice that we could all share um, successes, failures, uh, et cetera. Great. Thank you all for um, participating in the panel. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to Nick and the Science Collaborative team so we can get to some audience questions. Okay, thanks, Wendy. Thanks, folks, for answering questions. Uh, we got a few lined up already, which you all can see because you have the document open. So um, we'll see how many we can get through in the next few minutes here that we've got left to us. Um, if you don't see your question answered, we'll try to get it answered in the summary document that will go out a few days after the webinar wraps up. So uh, first question, people want to know, uh, how do we get a copy of the protocol? Lots of people asking about that. Yeah, that's a good question. So, Nick, I don't know if you can drop a link to our project website uh, from the Science Collaborative. The protocol, I don't think, is posted there yet, Nick, although you all have the document. I think it will be soon. Um, but correct me if I'm wrong. I looked earlier and didn't see it, but it will be uh, linked on our project page hosted by the Science Collaborative and publicly available to anyone that would like to see it, as will all of the data generated from this project. So the imagery, um, all the products, all that kind of thing. So you can sort of go through the project and or the protocol and, and, and sort of test yourself whether or not you're able to repl replicate sort of the outputs that we generated. So all of that is, is freely available. Awesome. I just dropped a link into the project page there, so we'll try to get that posted um, soon. So that's where you can find it. Uh, another question, it sounds like you just answered this one as well, but people are wondering if the data will be publicly available to use. It sounds like that's a yes, and so we'll just move on to the next one. Um, what is the price range of the type of drones you used? Yeah, good question. Um, well, so we had, let's see, we had uh, all DJI products, I think. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. So. Uh, any ranging from a Mavic, which is a couple K probably, to a Matrice 200, I think Eric had, which is probably on the order of what with the sensor on the order of 20 K, maybe something around there. I, um, how much, Eric? Less. Uh, 15. 15 oh. okay. Yeah. So, and and everything in between. I think GTM had an Inspire. Um, uh, and then so for the Mavic, for instance, we used in North Carolina, we also added an aftermarket multispectral sensor uh, to the airframe, which was another uh, couple of thousand dollars. So um, for RGB imagery alone, yeah, 2K, you could probably get into it and, and actually generate some pretty nice products. Awesome. Hey, okay. Nick. Yeah, what's up? I just wanted to jump in. I think that like one of the, the question before, I wanted to elaborate because um about the data that's available because brandon said the products where it would be posted i think brandon also like that question was ground it was ground data too and our ground survey okay. data is also going to be part of that um, right. yes that posting. so it's all going to be there the the drone products and the ground survey data so that's, right. that's I just excellent sorry thanks justin i missed that ground thanks, justin. okay let's see how many we can get through here uh, is ground elevation, is it ground elevation or vegetation height or both? How do you take into account uh, tide on products? And it looks like we actually have a revised version here. Uh, are you measuring ground elevation or vegetation height or both? How do you account for tide in the products? And I can shed that to the audience as well to see. Yeah, so um, while we're measuring both ground elevation and vegetation height, both in the field and with the drone derived products. Um, so the ground elevation in the field is RTK and then you're just taking a ruler and me measuring vegetation height. We did that a couple different ways. I didn't get to the details, but um, uh, we, we've measured it as the vegetation lies, which is how the sensor would probably see it. And then how often uh, what the monitoring protocols prescribe you to sh like uh, stretch the stem uh, to measure uh, canopy height. So we've done it, we did it both ways. Um, for the, the, the drone derived products, um, yeah, it generates two 3D models, one of which it's the, the photogrammetry software um, and, and point cloud filtering is trying to remove all vegetation and give you the ground elevation. That generally did not work very well where vegetation was dense. 
The second model it generates is a 3D, what it calls surface, what we call surface models, but that is supposed to be sort of the top of the canopy. So if you take the surface model and subtract the terrain model, you should get your canopy height. Um, but as I showed in our results, because the, the, the terrain model is not very good, the surface model is not great either, your canopy height is really pretty poorly estimated. In terms of tide, we, we, we structured, we standardized all the flight times so that we were flying um, in and around low tide. So there's not much in the way of tidal differences that we observed in this product or project, but it would, if the water level were up, really affect the quality of your products. And I don't know, Justin, if at Hobos there was any issues with that because you worked with them quite a bit. I don't know if you want to speak to that a little bit. Yeah, well, I mean, they're... They basically like their system, which is largely mangroves, right? It's 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 all um, the surface that was generated was just it was water or mangroves and a lot of that. So, but that provides it like that's its own problem with water sometimes creating these super weird artifacts with um, with this with this process. So um, it's manageable through, and that's something we cover a little bit. And but um, yeah, tide is definitely. Uh, we tried to take that as out as much as we could from from the process. Okay, uh, if there's no other thoughts, I'll move on to the next question here. We have a question about species determination. Uh, how did you assign classification to the imagery? There's a little comment to go with it. That is, I have heard that there needs to be on the ground calibration for classification uh, of the imagery paste that into the chat as well. Christiana, Brittany, you guys want to take that one? Uh, I guess I'll go for it. So, uh, where we go? The question, species determination. So originally we used an RGB image or the mosaic and we segmented it based off spectral and spatial attributes. And so, um, again, we did this in our Sentinel sites. And so these are areas that we typically can go out on our permanent boardwalks and actually see these ecotones of where the spartina is and where the juncus is. And it is pretty clear in most of the RGB imagery. I guess there are little fine lines of, you know, that border between different ecotones. And so that's kind of why North Inlet did a multi-species, um, I guess you could say, class, just because... It was really hard to determine um, where they intermixed and where they stopped. And so we used supervised classifiers. We tried out the random trees classifier, the support vector machine, and the, I'm blanking on the last one, but there was one more. And so it was like a little supervised, unsupervised classification machine, um, using training samples. And then we ground truth the data based off our RGB imagery. And then if anybody which we ground truth by knowing species in the plots on the ground. And, and to add to that, the training samples you provide are critically important to the, the, the quality of, of what is output. So that is the one, probably species specific classification is the one metric we measured where I would say you need to be a site expert and have really good you know, knowledge of the site to make that work. The other ones, the other parameters, generally speaking, the, the tech team, which had never been to the sites, could reproduce pretty good relative to what the reserve team has made. But without knowledge of those training samples to develop, you, you're not generating a very good species-specific habitat classification. Sure. Okay, one last quick question here. And then we'll wrap it up. Uh, did you come with this? Did you come up with a standard camera angle for elevation studies? Yeah, everything was shot in eight or straight down uh, for all our flights. We did sort of the, the mow the lawn pattern, uh, kind of a 2D pattern. Um, so perhaps if we had, had, had shot at different angles or done more of a 3D. Uh, pattern, we may have gotten better estimates of canopy height. I know Justin and his group have done quite a bit of work trying to get it at canopy height and have had mixed results, I think. Exactly. Mixed results, yeah. Mixed results. All right. Uh, well, we are at the top of the hour, I guess bottom of the hour, depending on how you look at it. Um, just want to give a quick thank you to all of our panelists and presenters who 
you know, talked to us through their project today and to Brandon for the great presentation, to Wendy for moderating the panel discussion. And thank you all for joining us and spending some time with us. I know that there's a lot of things you could be doing in, in the virtual world, so thanks for choosing this one. Um, we have a webinar coming up in a couple of weeks. July 14th is the next one. You should have probably already started seeing announcements for that if you get those. If not, there is a um, link in the email that will go out after the session ends um, tomorrow, I believe, around the same time. And we're going to be taking a break for the month of August, but we'll be back in September with more webinars. So uh, again, big thank you to everyone for joining us today and enjoy the rest of your day.